you. Um, I got to listen into the tail end. Uh, welcome to my car parked in the middle of the Bronx in New York City. I went to my son's cross country meet this morning. So <laughs> real life here happening. Um, great uh, panelists before, uh, Dr. Thompson and Dr. McGrath, you guys did a fantastic job. And I think it's a real segue into the topic that we have here. Um, I think that one of the most empowering things I've heard other physicians tell me, or one of the things that they found most empowering is starting to get involved at the legislative level and understanding that they really do have a voice and that legislators are interested in hearing what they have to say about their patients, about their practice, about the future, about ideas of how we can make our profession better. So with that said, I'm going to introduce our, um, our two panelists. Uh, State Representative Tom Oliver Oliverson is a practicing anesthesiologist and a Texas State Rep. Dr. O is recognized as an expert in office-based anesthesia, uh, and he consults with doctors and dentists throughout Texas to make office-based surgery safer for his patients. As a successful small business owner, he understands small business as the engine of our economy. He's active in organized medicine through the Texas Society of Anesthesiologists, and he's offered, authored as a state legislator over 120 bills during his uh, tenure in the Texas State House. So what a great opportunity for us to have an actual legislator who is a physician on board this panel. In addition, we have uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Robert Campbell, uh, who is certified in both anesthesia and pain medicine, uh, pain management. He practices in Lebanon, PA, and he's co-founder of Physicians Against Drug Shortages, a group that advocates to decrease drug shortages uh, and lower costs by repealing the safe harbor for legalized kickbacks that's part of the drug supply chain. In addition, Dr. Campbell's active in Physicians for Reform, and he's the past president of the Pennsylvania Society of Anesthesiologists uh, and a delegate to the American Society of Anesthesia. And in case you didn't know, our anesthesiologists are really gangbusters in terms of advocacy on surprise billing, on um, matters of scope of practice and so many other issues. He has experience in crafting legislation and extensive experience in meeting with lawmakers at both the state and national level. And when we planned this um, panel, we decided the first thing that we could do, um, and I do this in the spirit of, I really do, you know, there's a lot of distrust for lawmakers. And I think that I do view what they do as a public service. Um, and I think in that spirit, I'd like to hear from Dr. Oliverson to hear what his path was from medicine to becoming a legislator. And it might, might uh, open up some eyes as to what you go through to actually become a legislator. So take it away, uh, Dr. O. Thanks, Marion. Um, see, I can't see myself here. I'm, can you all see me okay? Okay. You're looking uber professional, oh, especially. To, I'm still the little screen on the little shot. box on the top of the screen, and I can see you very big. So I was just like, hmm, I wonder if, you know, how that's working. Anyway, um, no, I appreciate it. it look, it's, uh, I don't think it's for everybody. My journey, though, began uh, when I became uh, the guy who was sort of in charge of office based anesthesia for our group uh, and what happened was the Texas Society of Anesthesiologists was dealing with some issues with the medical board concerning regulation of office-based anesthesia and they needed an expert that really understood the business well and uh, so I volunteered and the next thing I know I'm sitting next to the president of the society uh, and basically leading the discussion and providing comments and feedback and uh, I think it was probably about nine months after that, I was working with a couple of legislators to file legislation to sort of close a few very bad loopholes where uh, somebody could uh, give a milligram of Versed and they had to be registered with the state board, but they could give a toxic dose of local anesthesia all day long and they didn't have to do anything. Um, and uh, that kind of got me interested. I, uh, I like to tell folks that, you know, the decision to run for uh, public office is not one to be taken lightly. It's not one that I really look forward to or really wanted to do. It's not something that I had grown up thinking, gee, it'd be neat to do that someday. And part of that, I think, is what Marion said is, you know, there is some frustration uh, around the fact that what you read and what you see is the impression that public officials are not necessarily uh, out there doing the best they can for the public as much as they're doing it for themselves. And 
so it was kind of a, a process for me. Uh, I ended up finally meeting some folks who were serving in the legislature uh, who convinced me that, um, you know, that there was room for somebody with, you know, the right uh, moral compass and the right ethics to, to be involved, that there was a place. And, uh, you know, most importantly, I spent a lot of time in prayer about it. And I think this is one of those things that if God calls you to do something, uh, then you're going to be equipped to do it and do it well. And I certainly felt like that was the case for me. So uh, an open seat came up. My state legislator retired. Uh, I remember uh, running in that race. It was my first ever real political experience outside of basically being a patient safety advocate and, you know, sitting on that side of the desk and advocating for good health care policy. And, uh, you know, God smiled on us and we prevailed with 70 percent of the vote. Um, and since that time, you know, I've enjoyed representing the people uh, in my district on a variety of issues. And I guess the last thing I'll say is I think we get so used to dealing with healthcare. I think um, one of the things for me that was a big uh, wake up call is when you get in there, you realize that you're knowledgeable about only a fraction. And by that, I mean one less than one one hundredth of the issues that you're likely to have to vote on. Uh, and so you, you know, you drink from a fire hose literally for the first uh, year that you're there trying to understand all of the policies and issues and things that you've never even thought about as a doctor. So I think that speaks to a, a large portion of why what we do is so important because there are just so many legislators, it's not their background and they just don't, they don't know, they don't deal with healthcare. So unless we're educating them, they don't know. Fantastic. Um, and Dr. O, and I hope it's okay that I say Dr. O, it saves me three syllables each time. <laughs> you can call me Tom too, that's fine. Okay. Even better, Tom, it still saves the three syllables. So um, if you had to tell physicians like three things that you want them to know about what it's like to walk the path of running for office and serving an office that they may not know. You know, I mean, like patients come to us and they have their, their uh, concerns, suggestions, worries, and you know, there's things that we wish that they knew. What, what do you know now as a legislator that you'd like to tell physicians? Yeah, I think so. Great question. I think a couple of things. It is going to take more time than you think it's going to take away from your practice, uh, no matter how well you plan it out and do the calculations in your head and say to yourself, I think I can do this. There's always, especially during campaign season, there's always uh, events and block walking and vote getting, you know, things that you need to do to get your name out there to to win. Um, I ended up having to take four extra weeks of vacation uh, the year that I ran in the primary. <clears throat> and that time was literally spent from sunup till sundown, knocking on people's doors, uh, you know, discussing with them who I was and why I thought I was the right guy to represent them in Austin. And, the, you know, the time investment is humongous. And I think that's a, obviously a barrier for a lot of physicians. Uh, we don't realize at the time and how much time that it's really going to take. The second thing I would say is um, doctors notoriously have thin skin when it comes to people being critical of them and, uh, you know, questioning their knowledge or their authority. And I think if you're going to run for office, you got to develop some thick skin very quickly and realize that, yes, people will lie. Um, and yes, sometimes people won't lie. They'll just say something that's not factual, but they believe it so strongly that there's nothing you can do to convince them otherwise. Um, they will go on Twitter and Facebook and say nasty things about you. Uh, and you just kind of have to let that go. Uh, you have to resist the urge to engage uh, with every person. I, I know a lot of doctors that get frustrated when patients come into their office with something they read on Google uh, and, uh, you know, don't confuse my medical degree with your Google search kind of stuff. Uh, that's a everyday occurrence when you're a state uh, representative or certainly the federal level. You constantly have people questioning everything you do, even if it's something that they know that you should be super knowledgeable about, because at the end of the day, there are people on the other side of that issue and uh, they don't want to see you win. Even if it's the right thing, it's not good for their business. And so they want to prevail. Um, so I think I'll think I'll stop there. Those are the two things I can think of that are really important, I think, for folks to know. Okay, wonderful. Um, I do see some questions that are coming up and I think that particular one can, uh, I, 
we do have like a kind of almost like a plan. So I think we can answer as we get towards the end of our plan. We can hold some of the questions at the end. Um, I think personally, from what I've seen in advocating at the state and the national level, our voices are needed now more than ever. Would you agree with that as a lawmaker? Oh, uh, unquestionably, unquestionably. I, I still, so uh, in my home state, I am the house uh, author of the surprise medical billing bill that we passed in Texas, which was uh, very much uh, more fair to providers than what is currently being proposed in Congress. Uh, and when I, when I as a legislator go and educate folks at the federal level about the issue, I'm always surprised now that the staff knows the issue quite well, but the legislator just may not. Um, and so I, I think it's critical. I, I really don't think that people understand very much what it is that we do and how these laws, the unintended consequences of these ideas that are being presented may actually uh, harm not only patients, but actually harm the entire healthcare system. So our voices are critical. And I would say as a, as a positive to that, look, at the end of the day, you're still a physician. Uh, when you show up, especially if you're wearing your white coat, uh, people are inclined to hear what you have to say. They want to hear what you have to say. You are still a representative of one of the most respected professions uh, as far as careers that there is. And I think that you do have a certain amount of credibility as a doctor when you come in and say, well, let me tell you how this would really work, how, how this would unfold. So yeah, absolutely, couldn't agree more. Agree, and I wanna switch over um, to uh, Bob, Dr. Campbell. Um, and Bob and I have done some advocacy work together. And uh, you know, Bob, has this been, you, what, what's been your experience of what you see when, because you and I have both taken younger physicians in to become advocates for the first time. What's your perspective of what they find out and how they see it and their response to going? Yes, uh, Marion, thank you. <clears throat> My name is Bob Campbell. I've been in Pennsylvania practicing for 31 years. And I've been involved in advocacy really since 1999 at the state and national level. Uh, I, I've learned a lot over the years. Um, some of it is what Tom had said. He said it takes a lot of time to do advocacy work. The other thing is whatever issue you are striving to work on, it's always gonna take more time than you can imagine to come to a conclusion. Um, it's just the way the process works. I call it kind of a trench warfare. Um, the other thing that I've noticed consistently in, in, in my involvement with advocacy is that we just don't have enough doctors involved. Um, I, I often hear, uh, I was in a senator's office one time and I asked the guy who took the phone calls, um, how often do you hear from physicians from the state of Rhode Island? This was the senator from Rhode Island. And he said, never. He says, you guys never call. Uh, so sometimes it, that can be to our advantage because we've been so underrepresented. If we find people who are willing to step up, even if you take a week from your practice and, and plan it out and do put in a good week's worth of work out of, out, out of the whole year, it will get noticed. And, and that's an important thing. The third thing that I've noticed, and, and I'll give you an example of that right today, is networking is so important. And Marion and I got to know each other and have done some things that I could not have done without her. And Dr. O, um, uh, I've been involved in balanced billing in Pennsylvania for three years. So I'm going to introduce you to our team. <laughs> and there we're going to network. <laughs> Sounds like a great plan. Yeah. And, and you know, so the networking part, I, I, I've always been able to find that the doctors, those few doctors who are involved in advocacy, um, will step up. Uh, they really will step up. Uh, and... And of course, the problem is getting more people involved. Uh, I'll leave you with one other uh, little uh, bit of advice is that the thing that we, I, I've been very impressed with Free to Care. You know, I, I see there's 21 member organizations, 2.3 million patients, 37,000 physicians. Uh, our biggest weakness when I do advocacy in Pennsylvania or in Washington, D.C., is that we do not have a cohesive 
organized voice. Uh, we just, whether it's egos that keep small organizations small, um, or our inability, our, our, our extreme desire for autonomy, uh, for whatever reasons, we've been able to come together. And I think for the first time ever, I've seen things have gotten so screwed up, I'll say, I, I could use worse terms, that doctors are finally kind of realizing, hey, we either have to come together or we're all going to be toast. And, and that's what I tell people in their organizations. Uh, you can stay small and in balanced billing, we've had multiple specialty groups who want to splinter off and do their own thing on balanced billing. And I say, if that happens, we're all toast. And so we've been able to keep people together, but it is a hard thing an impulse that physicians have. So if, if free to care is that vehicle or maybe the, the, the best vehicle to date, time will tell. I think it's really, really powerful what they've already done. Where all the different coalition members, and I'll put out a, a challenge to the coalition and to David and uh, Citizens Health and everyone. We've got had some pretty impressive letter writing campaigns. I'd like to see if we can even step it up another level. And if we can plan and coordinate these letters, I'm telling you, make a huge difference. And if we can get people, if we can get 3,000 people in one week to sign on to a letter, maybe with two weeks, let's, let's try to get 10,000 physicians. Uh, it's something we have to work on in the infrastructure. And, and that would be a way for free to care to really, really uh, raise the bar for physician advocacy. Thank you, Marion. Oh, super. Okay. All right. So um, as I expected, we'd be a little desultory here and there's some questions coming in that I, that I hope will be helpful as well. Um, our, our next portion was to actually go through uh, the tips that would engage and maintain um, relationships with physicians at both the state and the national level. But I think what I'd almost like to do as I'm hearing this discussion go on is describe a process by which physicians can become involved. Um, you know, my question to you, Bob, was like, what have we seen when we, you know, take physicians down to Washington, D.C.? And I'd like to give my response to that. It's, oh, <laughs> I, I, I asked the question because I thought it was a definite good one, and I, I'd like both of us to get our take on that. Um, and, you know, what I have seen is, you know, and I'll give my own experience. The first time I went to Washington, D.C. in 2015, I, I was intimidated. You know, I was thinking to myself, wow, you know, all of these lawmakers, they must know oodles about healthcare, and I'm not really going to have much of a voice. I don't know if I'll get to speak, et cetera. Is this going to be worth it? But I'm going to go try and at least see what it looks like. And, you know, I don't mean any disrespect, but I got to D.C. and I thought, oh, oh, wow, <laughs> we should have been here a long time ago. And it, it, it isn't, I think healthcare has become so complex. I've had lawmakers tell me, we don't really understand. This is an issue that intimidates us. So uh, starting small and, and making yourself available, forming a relationship with your lawmaker at your state and your national level. Find time when they're back in their district. It's no secret. You can go on to your state level and the national level, congressional and senatorial level calendars. Just look them up, Google them, and you can find out when they're back in the district. Look for some times that you're available and ask for a meeting. You know, something else that helps is if they um, happen to have events coming up, you can certainly ask the staff when you call, is there anything that I could attend that would make it easier to open up the door? And then, you know, present yourself as an advocate. If you're part of Free to Care, to step forward and say, hey, I'm part of a larger organization that encompasses 37,000 physicians and 2.3 million citizens. That means something. And, you know, it gets people's attention and then you become Make yourself memorable. Um, one of the things that I've learned in, in going in to offices or in starting a relationship was, is that I'll go to their websites and I'll, they all have a bio. And I try to find some point of connectivity or some point that relates to the issue that, that I mean to go to talk about. Um, you know, Bob, you brought up signing petitions and signing on to letters, and that is certainly a really helpful way to make it happen. But I do encourage everyone with an earshot here uh, to be persistent in trying to get yourself to an event or to a meeting to start to form the relationship so that they can see that you're real, that you're genuine. And you have to think about 
how can I make myself indispensable, useful, and helpful to this person so that we open up a conversation and, and, uh, and we can have an ongoing established communication network. Dr. Uh, o, Tom, do you want to add anything to that, to that issue about forming the relationship? I, yeah, actually, um, I, I look, I, th I think the reality is that, that these relationships best begin before you ever have an issue that you need to talk to the legislator about. The, the reality is, at the end of the day, what we all want is to be a, a point of contact or a key contact for that legislator. You, you, your goal should be to have your cell phone number and your name in their phone so that when you text them, they know who it is. Um, now that may seem like a tall order, but the reality is, is if you wait until you go to the Capitol Hill or you go to your state legislature and you're meeting them for the first time, you're already behind the eight ball. What you want to do, I believe, is work, you know, get to know the legislator back home in the district, find, make time to uh, learn about their positions. If they're uh, a, a person that you feel like you could support, then do so. Um, help them raise funds for re-election, uh, work on their campaign. I will tell you that I meet with tons of folks and I don't remember, you know, everyone I meet with, but I know the names, faces, and backgrounds of anyone who's ever spent a Saturday with me knocking on doors uh, trying to get the vote out. I mean, there are things that you can do as a physician to really maximize the ability to have that relationship. Every human, uh, legislators included, only has so much bandwidth to be able to take in information. So when you sign on a letter and you, you know, a petition or whatever, all of this is helpful. But what you want is to be um, the person in the district that that legislator reaches out to when they have a question. Uh, let, me, let me give you a quick example of how this works. So my first session, I, I've sat on the insurance committee since I've been there. Um, and one, our first session, we had a bill that had to do with title insurance. Now, I don't know anything about title insurance other than I've, uh, when you buy a house, you need to get it, right? Um, we had this bill and it was brought to us and it sounded kind of good. It was talking about deregulation or talking about competition and I'm a conservative guy and those are kind of buzzwords for me. Uh, and then I got a call and it was from a gentleman that I knew in the district. Uh, he was a realtor, but he also had a title business and he proceeded to explain to me, uh, how this bill would impact his business back home. Uh, and the reality was it completely changed my view on that particular piece of legislation. I, I voted based on the fact that I knew I had constituents at home and this was going to adversely impact their business. It was going to cause them to have to lay off employees. It was going to have all of these unintended negative consequences. Uh, and it changed the way I, I looked at that legislation at the end of the day. That's the relationship you're looking for, but you have to start. Now is actually the best time to start, right? Re-election campaigns are gearing up. People will be running in 2020. Every member of Congress is up for re-election. I think most members of, of the lower house of your state are probably up for re-election. Some of your senators are. Uh, build that relationship outside of advocacy first. That way, when you need to be, uh, you need to be an advocate, um, they know who you are, they remember, and, and it's not something that's just sort of, yeah, it was a nice meeting, we'll look into it, we'll, we'll see you soon. You, you have a personal relationship with that legislator. I, great point, and I, I want to tie it into some of the things I'm seeing on the chat. Um, you know, someone uh, brought up that the legislative system is not accessible to physician schedule. When hearings happen, if physicians want to testify, sometimes they're brought up in 48 hours notice. It's very frustrating. Um, even physician legislators don't have a lot of time to talk to individual physicians about issues. Um, that is one of the points we bring up, having the relationship so that you can become almost the trusted one where you're texting them and letting them know what you're seeing out there so that you've already built that time into making that relationship. And I mean, if if I, as a part-time pediatrician and a soccer mom, could manage to do that and <laughs> have that textual relationship, I'm sure you can too. Um, it's just, it does take some time to build that up. Uh, and it's also brought up here that 
we're getting completely out donated and out visited by lobbyists who are working for quite frankly things that are important to us and our patients. I agree 100%. Part of the idea behind free to care would be that now we have a big network of physicians. If all of us start working at our state level, our national level, start building those relationships, make those visits when we can. And if we in tandem are all saying the same things at the same time, you know, for instance, um, we're going to hear, I believe tomorrow, uh, House Bill 3708 is not going to be helpful to our, it's going to be very toxic to the DPC community. And many of us have made phone calls. We're doing it all at the same time when the issue comes up. And we're looking at legislators who are hungry for information on health care because many of them don't understand it. They're frustrated and they're confused. And if they're hearing all the same thing from many of us, um, that's a, a way that we can get information out there. I know other groups do this. At PA, we try to send email notices to our membership to say, hey, we have an action item. We want you to call your legislator right now and here's what to tell them. Here's the background information on on what we're seeing. So even though we're not able to necessarily be there and testify, at least making those phone calls and trying to make them um, stack on top of each other. And it's not only important that you do this yourself, but find some friends in your physician community and your patient community that are willing to do this along with you. Um, I was looking at the chat. Can I, can I add one thing with regards to that? Sure, please do. So, so I'm seeing a lot on the chat about, you know, lobbyists and physicians not having, you know, time and stuff like that. Let me just assure you as a, as an elected official that constituents always outrank lobbyists. It doesn't matter whether the lobbyist has quote, you know, 24 seven access, they don't. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, it doesn't matter what the lobbyist wants a legislator to do or whether they, you know, are going to support that legislator financially or whatever. At the end of the day, no legislator in their right mind wants to go against the wishes of their constituents. Constituents always outrank lobbyists. But the thing is, you don't want to just be a constituent. You want to be an activist. You want to be somebody that shows up. You want to be somebody that follows the vote. You want to be somebody who they count on for help when they're running for re-election. It's that relationship uh, that you can build. Um, but yeah, don't be discouraged about the whole, you know, lobbyist thing. They, they get paid to do that. Uh, but every single one of us knows that they're getting paid to basically say what it is they're getting paid to say. That's never going to be the same as a heartfelt testimony from a constituent. <clears throat> so, so Marion, if uh, I can step in here, sometimes with physicians, and I, I've seen a lot of the chat room material, you have to kind of find your place. So let me give you the AB, my ABCs of advocacy. You need three things. Uh, you need a grassroots network. And what that grassroots network means is, for instance, in Pennsylvania, we have 50 state senators and 201 representatives. So what we try to do is have a physician have a relationship with each one of those members in the districts. And kind of like uh, Tom said, not when you need something, but just here's my card. I'm a go-to guy if you have a question. What, what the way I usually introduce myself to a legislator, and I've had a lot of new ones in the state because of redistricting and different other reasons. But I always try to tell them one thing that I think will impress them. Like one thing would be, uh, I'm a member of Free to Care representing 37,000 physicians. Um, and then after I tell them something to impress them, I you very humbly say, look, I'm a constituent and I'd like to be here for you if you need subject matter expertise. If I don't have it, I'll find somebody who has it. And they appreciate that because a lot of them have to deal with so many issues, they don't know a lot about healthcare. So the first thing is that grassroots. The second thing is you have to have a, a lobbying platform of some kind. So free to care, for instance, is one. Uh, I'm a member of the Pennsylvania Society of Anesthesiologists, the American Society of Anesthesiologists. Those organizations have lobbyists and you, know, you need an organized effort that then 
triggers the grassroots people to get involved and how to do it, when to do it. And then the last thing you really do need, and you don't need a lot of this, but I always tell people you do need a pack. So if there's a new senator that uh, comes into the state of Pennsylvania, I show up with a $250 check. Hello, I'm here to help you if you need help understanding healthcare issues. And that $250 check goes a long ways with a new state senator. It doesn't take as much at the state level. Um, at the national level, it, there's a higher bar for that. But those are the three things you need. So when you're thinking as a physician, what can I do? Don't get overwhelmed and say, I have to be, the, I have to be in Washington whenever they call or whenever a bill comes up, or I have to uh, uh, go and meet every senator or every congressman's staff. Now you have to find your niche. And, and again, the thing we've been missing is a large organized effort. And I, I divide our organizations, healthcare or health uh, physician organizations into legacy and grassroots. And our grassroots members, which are really the, the majority of the free to care, they really have the ideas, the motor, the, the, the I guess Jane used the term, the, the, the minds and the spines. Uh, some of the legacy organizations are, I'm going to be very honest, they're a little bit lame and they're a little more self-introverted as far as their own motivations. So find a, find a, 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 a platform for uh, lobbying that you believe in. And uh, maybe that's free to care. Maybe it's something else. But get involved with that and then get to know your legislator. And I'll tell you one other thing that I'll do, and then I'll hand it back to you, Mary. One of the, an idea I had years ago was every time we have a new legislation and a new legislative session in Pennsylvania, I host a dinner. And it's, fun, it's paid for by my Society of Anesthesiologists. And I invite all the Republicans to one dinner, all the Democrats to another dinner. I give them a brief presentation and mostly say, I have resources, subject matter experts on healthcare. We've not had a legislator in Pennsylvania who is a physician since 1972. Wow. So they appreciate that. And what happens is you do that every session, whether you have something hot on the burner or not. Now then when something really white hot is present, like balanced billing is now, we can come in with a established relationship, subject matter expertise. And the one thing that the, the people always tell me is that we appreciate physicians for what you do and the fact that you are one of the few institutions that has not been uh, succumbed to the, the entire corruption that seems to be ever present in advocacy. So we have genuine voices. We, we may have small voices and we may not be as organized, but they really do listen. Uh, they would listen more if, if we can get free to care to be a hundred thousand physicians, but but let's get there. Let's use what we have now. Find your little niche. Don't get overwhelmed. Uh, you don't do it all. We'll, whatever you don't do, we'll assign it to Mary, and, and she'll she'll follow up. Thank you. Well, I'm going to follow up right now with a couple of questions from the Q and A because I don't want them to get lost in the shuffle. Um, someone asked, in spite of my, uh, my efforts and reputation, my congressional representative and senators have yet to respond to invitations to meet with them. My thought, um, thought is be uh, for them uh, several options, opportunities, and I think I would try to attend an actual meeting. Um, sometimes they'll hold open houses. If this is something that you're in the position to do so, call and offer to come to a campaign event if it's something that you feel spending money on. I do understand certainly don't necessarily want to donate to someone they don't believe in and I, I certainly respect that. Came up, how do you effectively influence lawmakers in an environment that is so partisan? Is it worth trying? I think that um, as one of the that is exactly what I tried to do because I think right now in healthcare, I think both our patients and the physicians see that there's so much that needs fixing. Efforts in that paper were to put together 
solutions that were all aisle crossers. And, you know, the major topics certainly, you know, fit that. And to, uh, is that had bipartisan resonance. Um, the other, legislator is, it's worth meeting with them. I meet across the aisle all the time. And um, I think that it honestly gives us as physicians more credence and more respect to try to, to get ideas out there because healthcare is, is personal. It's, it's not about ours and it's not about these. So I think that's definitely worth trying. And the other question that I didn't want to get lost in the Q and A um, was just specific to you, uh, Tom, it said, uh, we had a surprise medical bill pass in our state. It didn't cure the problem, put the onus in the uh, division of insurance. Um, <clears throat> yeah, let me answer that one specifically. Uh, yeah, so uh, we do communicate with the Department of Insurance. Um, I'm, I meet periodically uh, as a legislator with the Commissioner of Insurance, and I have a very good working relationship with, in, with the insurance department. Uh, and and our, our legislation okay. in Texas does use uh, arbitration as well. It's very similar to New York in that respect. Uh, and we're in the process of implementing it, uh, some changes to it and sort of expanding on it. Uh, right now, so it's something we are we are meeting with um, with them periodically. Yeah, good working relationship. Okay, excellent. Um, I'm going to go through some other um, comments that are in here because I want people to hear what them beyond the benefits of the profession and our nation. Agree a hundred percent. Um, you know, in the previous uh, discussion, Judy was talking about how we're not getting together. Whenever I've advocated and done so with a group of physicians, just that magic to me to watch people who have never been involved get involved and the light bulb go on. Um, I'll actually give as a personal example. I took uh, three younger women physicians in. They had a meeting the one that arranged the meeting said to me as we were going, well, you're going to lead, aren't you? I said, absolutely not. You got this. And she, I mean, I think she was a little reserved. Watched her go into turbocharge. She understood her voice was needed. And I think it's, it's empowering. I think it's a little bit of an antidote to burnout too, to tell you the truth. Um, Another comment, uh, research indicates healthcare is the number one concerned about. It's a priority for our citizens. Agree. Mentioned several times, physicians are confused about the issue. We not only we'll run through these eight points. And those are gold, because if you can tell a story that's relatable um, to the general public, if you can tell that to a lawmaker, you're really touching on the point. You're making healthcare understandable to them. You're making it human to them. Um, so I, I think that that's, uh, that's not under the gun. If you're only calling when you need them, it's less effective. Get to know them before. Uh, someone else brought about bringing a set up, um, you know, if, if they felt so uh, compelled. Uh, let's see, someone else brought up, it's important to bring a talking tear sheet to hand out to our patients um, so that patients understand what they had to advocate for. And I think when we hit crucial points, uh, whether it's at the state level or at the national level, that's a great idea is to be able to hand something out to patients and to say, and to leave them with the number. Um, Whenever I put something out there for PPA, I try to leave them. Uh, I do it in the following manner. Urgent, we need your action here. Here's the issue. We need you to call your lawmaker. Here's a place that you can go. We 
your zip code and all of your state and national level office numbers, which is really helpful. Something like that to hand out to patients is really helpful. And I will say that anything we send out to PPA like that, you can certainly share. Uh, let me see, someone asked, what's the best way for grassroots physician advocacy groups to work with national and state medical associations? Do either of you wanna field this, my panelists? I could do that. Uh, vol volunteer to be a uh, grassroots champion with your state senator and your state representative. And that's where you go and you meet them. And don't go specifically with, oh, I need you to do this, but go in the home district when they're in their district. You can almost always get a one-to-one -one meeting in that way. And then when the state organization needs you, they have you on their database that says, hey, we have a bill that's coming up next week. Can you call this office and tell them who you are and what you, how you want it to vote? Um, the other thing that, that is kind of when you want to meet these people, you need to have interesting conversation. And one of the things I do typically is I'll look in the news on, on things and it gets to the, what Mary was talking about, bipartisan and taking away the, the, the ugly politics. So like if I were to go and meet someone today for the first time, I would go in and tell them, I would say, uh, and this just was in the news today, you know that we have a, over the next six years, cancer rates are going to increase by 40% in America with our aging population. 40% increase in new diagnosis of cancers. You know we have a short, we anticipate a shortage of 2,200 oncologists over the next six years. So again, you get to the point of physician well-being, the system is broken, uh, do we want the best and the brightest? Do we want good health care delivery? We're paying more than ever, 18% of GDP, but we're getting less and less care. So sometimes you take a news hook. Those are things that they want to know because their constituents, non-physicians, general constituents might be reading that very article. So that's another way to kind of have conversation and make yourself relevant. Um, so, yeah, start out. Be, be a... a, a uh, uh, Know your representative. All you got to do is meet them once. They'll be. They'll remember you. Trust me. They will remember you. We had someone here in Pennsylvania, Joe Galassi, who met then Senator Toomey when he first became a state representative. Worked his way up through, and you know, to this day, Senator Toomey, you know, will always remember Joe for being there when he was a nobody. And. Uh, so to this day, we can get in with Senator Toomey when we need to just because of those relationships. So those are the little things. It's more relationships and discussions. And you can't do everything, uh, but you can do your small, small part. Thank you. No problem. We did have a, um, a couple other tips that I wanted to add in there so that when, when you do start to form that relationship, some particular tips, um, did you want to speak, Tom, to, it, it's really important, the staffers, and Tom, I think you said this, it's even more important at the national level, getting to know the staffers, because oftentimes they're the ones writing the legislation. So if you know the healthcare um, legislative assistant, that's in some ways more important than knowing the congressman. Um, and I always tell people when, when you get to D.C., uh, not that you know they're often disappointed to find that they're not meeting with the actual lawmaker it's nice for a photo op that's great but really those staffers are important tom do you have any more to comment on that yeah mary and i i think you're right on i, I think that you know it is one of those things that I, I have literally seen this go sideways where a group comes in uh, it was funny actually i was there not recent or pretty recently talking about surprise medical billing and my, one of my senators and a group came in and they had a meeting with Senator Cruz and, you know, things come up. He had, a, he had to go to a budget hearing or something like that. Uh, and they just became totally unhinged about it. You know, well, we had brought a constituent with us. Why can't we meet with the senator? You know, we don't want to meet with the policy person. Well, the policy person is the one who's going to advise the senator on how to vote on that issue. Um, even at my level, uh, there are things that I'm working on personally because I know a lot about that area. But there are things that my staffers basically advise me, you know, they take all the meetings and they advise me 
you know, if it's something like uh, water, you know, uh, flooding, infrastructure, stuff like that, that may not be something that I'm super gifted at or knowledgeable about. So they're going to, uh, they're going to take those meetings for me and they're going to advise me. So, I mean, yeah, it's very critical, not only to meet with the staffers, but to be gracious. Don't, don't act like all put out because you can't meet with the member, uh, especially at the federal level there, if they're actually there, uh, which is becoming a shorter and shorter window during the week. Um, they've got about a bazillion things going on. So the staffers are really, really, really critical in those meetings, I would agree. Wonderful. Another tip that we uh, had come up with, uh, it, it's really important when you advocate to make it about the patient first. I don't know how to say this any other way other than, unfortunately, very few people are going to care about the plight of the physician other than if we're talking about shortages down the line and how can we help that. But uh, making your story, get it back to the patient. I remember one particular meeting I was at, it was very high level. Someone had come in by phone and the issue they wanted to talk about was a reimbursement and the reimbursements were falling and falling and falling and this was a big problem. And they were coming in by phone. It was with the actual legislator and just the look on the legislator's face just said it all. You know, there was no way he was going to be interested in hearing any more about, about this. It's, I think it's really important that what we make this about first is our patients. Comments on that, gentlemen? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's totally right. You know, that um, I, I personally, as a, as a legislator, as a conservative legislator, I don't like rent-seeking behavior. And what I mean by that is I don't like taking meetings with groups when they come in and tell me that, you know, they need more money from the government for this, that, or the other thing. Uh, and so what I want to hear about is how is this going to help the community? How is this going to help my constituents? Um, I think it's always right to, to frame it in terms of how it's going to impact the patients. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't have a conversation about the fact that, you know, uh, this, uh, you know, let, you know, going back to the surprise medical billing issue, because that's one we're all focused on, you know, the, the benchmarking idea will cause me uh, to, you know, uh, go out of business, uh, and that I may be the only primary care provider or uh, anesthesiologist or surgeon in, in my community. It may cause my hospital to go out of business. And there's nothing wrong with sort of bringing those real world consequences to bear. Um, but I, I agree, I don't think anyone likes to hear you know, the we need more money thing, because that's kind of what everybody likes to say when they come to, to Washington or to the state capitol is, you know, we're not getting enough money from X, Y, and Z program. Okay. Uh, the, Bob, it, go ahead. Oh, well, I was gonna say in, in, the line, in that line, one of the points I wanted to make is when you meet with these people, you always wanna put yourself in their shoes. And we come in with a, a great passion and it's an urgency but you do you have to recalibrate you can't be too aggressive but you just have to really make your point and one of the things that you can do to put yourself in their shoes is to realize they are inundated with lobbyists who come in who have myopic visions who have proposals that benefit them and their trade you know that, that benefit them and this is a conversation i've had with a lot of the we have some uh, in, uh, people in the medical industrial complex who are starting to come around to repeal the safe harbor as a concept. And I say, well, yes, that would benefit you, but you need to have one other position that just benefits patients and not you. Because the legislators really, I get this a lot, it, they call it the myopic self-serving lobbyist who is just simply trying to get more dollars for their people who are paying their paycheck. So we have an advantage in that. We can talk about our patients. None of us are there getting paychecks to do this. So uh, we have an advantage and use that genuine, unconflicted perspective to tell the truth. And it will go farther than you, than you, than you think. Thank you. Yeah, agree. You know, Bob, this is kind of a tangential off of that point, but something that I see that often happens and uh, you know, in the way that people advocate there's, there's a lot of legacy organizations that are national level built around specialty. 
Um, and obviously one that's multi-specialty, you know, being the AMA. And there's a lot of them that are built around the state level. And there's a lot of state level, you know, you're a member of the Pennsylvania Society of Anesthesia um, and the national level anesthesia. But I think that being part of the grassroots to, to be able to speak for what helps another group of physicians is really important. This balanced billing issue is not going to affect me as a pediatrician, but I sure as heck see how it's going to hurt first the anesthesiologists, the radiologists, and the ER docs that are out there. And if they're not as available, then that's going to be a problem down the line for us pediatricians. And it's certainly going to hurt all of our patients. And then after those guys get the hurt put on them, it's going to hurt our specialists who are then just going to be dropping out of ER call and now we're right back at the patients. So I think, um, and I, I was reminded of this this week, there was a chat going on and um, I brought up advocating uh, to push back on House Bill 3708 that is going to be toxic to direct primary care. And someone brought up to me, well, you know, I'm a pediatrician, and that's not going to help me. Very few pediatricians do TV, DPC. And that's true. I'm a pediatrician and I did a lot of work to try to make this happen because I think in the larger scheme, it's helping the sustenance of physicians. It's helping to make sure that we have a sustainable profession. So even though it won't help me personally, I'm willing to step up to bat for that. And I think actually it almost, if others start to see that, you know, pediatricians are willing to speak for specialists and specialists are willing to speak for primary care doctors, we're helping each other, we're drawing ourselves together and I think it'll encourage others to start to get involved because if it doesn't specifically matter to me and I'm still doing it, it's almost more worth something. Yes. And, and if you follow uh, uh, the dots, if you connect all the dots, usually if there is something like House Bill 3708 or other policy that gets proposed like balanced billing that physicians really don't like, that it hurts patients, it hurts us, Usually it's from one of two groups. It's either the insurance companies or the health systems. So the American Hospital Association or AHIP. So sometimes like with balanced billing, that will greatly enrich the insurance companies. And so that which enriches the insurance companies, they're not always looking after patients' best interests. You know, they are in, in the business of making money off, an ins off of a product. So sometimes if you connect those dots, you start to realize the relevance of it. So if, if uh, when I, I very rarely, have I ever been in a setting where I've seen the American Hospital Association or the America's Health Insurance Plan lobby promote policy which would truly help patients. It just, it usually truly enriches them. And they are the two big, big groups, and we are the, the little pawn, which needs to get a little stronger so that we can have a louder voice against those two powerful uh, interest groups. Yeah, agree. You know, and keep in mind, all those special interest groups, they never lose sight of getting what they want. They always stay united, and we must do the same. Is it all right, uh, panelists, if what we do is just kind of wrap up? We have, I think, about four minutes left. And I just want to reiterate some points to hammer home. And then I'll ask you to respond to them. So what I'd like to say is, is that now more than ever, our voice is needed for anyone new and young and thinking I've never done this before. I feel a little intimidated. Please don't be because your voice is important. Your experience is important. As a physician, you are exposed to a wide plethora of the human experience, and you have a knowledge from being insiders that will make you more knowledgeable about healthcare than most legislators in the room. It's really, it's just so crucial for you to get involved. In having a network like Free to Care and the other grassroots groups that make it up, it's huge if we can find things that we can come together on and speak at the same time in the same voice, I think it really can turn the tide on crafting good legislation, on preventing bad legislation. Um, and, you know, as Bob, as you said, don't, don't try to bite off more than you can chew. You don't have to be everywhere. There's a lot of us in free to care. There's a lot of us in other organizations. 
get involved where you can. And when you do get involved, keep it uh, in mind, it's about those relationships, um, not just with the lawmakers, but with the aides. When you speak, make sure that you're speaking about your patients first. Uh, we didn't mention this outright, but I do think it's important. A lot of people go to their lawmakers and they kvetch. It's important to come with a solution. Think it through. Uh, it is part of why we wrote the white paper. Um, your personal stories are a huge help. Uh, and lastly, uh, the last two things I'll say is that I, I like what someone said. I think it was an anonymous question. Is it important to, you know, to be bipartisan about things? Absolutely. Don't be discouraged if your lawmaker doesn't match your own party. Uh, and then lastly, uh, keep in mind, you need to be patient. This is a long distance race. Legislation moves much slower than our, what we're used to in medicine. And those are my final points. Uh, Tom, do you have any to make yourself? I think, you know, you've covered it quite well, Mary. And I guess, you know, the, the things that I would emphasize is, again, you know, if you really want to be an effective advocate, that should begin long before an issue comes up upon which you need help. You, you need to build a relationship with that legislator so that you're a go-to person for them. Um, and that's not something that happens when you just walk in the door for a meeting for the first time. So I would encourage, I don't, there are precious few people in this world that volunteer on campaigns. I can assure you that if anybody listening to this was to call up their state senator, state legislator, or even their congressman who's running for reelection and said, hey, when are you block walking next uh, on a Saturday? I'd, I'd like to come block walk with you for four hours and you know, as a physician in the community. Um, you will never be forgotten for doing that. You, you would put yourself in probably one one hundred, you know, I'm sorry, less than one percent of people uh, who, you know, express a, a position on an issue that actually were willing to, to help out somebody. Uh, you just can't ignore folks like that. So I think that's critical. Um, we didn't cover some of the don't do. So let me just throw those out really quick. Um, never, ever, 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 ever uh, walk into a legislator's office and remind them of what it is that you did for them in the last election cycle. Hence, you really need your, their support on this particular issue. Uh, if you are there for them, that goes without saying. They know that. But if you bring it up as a matter of the conversation, now you've created that mysterious term that we're all looking for these days called the quid pro quo. Uh, and legislators will, you know, recoil in horror uh, from somebody who says, uh, remember, I gave a bunch of money to your reelection campaign. I really need you to be with me on this particular vote. You can't ever say that uh, when you're going in. Um, and, uh, you know, like I said, I'm going to talk, you know, just briefly, the bipartisanship is important. Look, a lot of what we work on as legislators on health care, these are bipartisan issues. There are precious few issues that are truly partisan issues. You can, you know, if you take a drug price uh, concerns, pharmaceutical drugs, I know something we're all concerned about, uh, you know, so your concern is that prices are expensive. Um, so go and talk to your conservative, you know, Republican legislators about, gosh, you know, don't you believe in free markets? Um, isn't there a point at which a patent should run out and competition should enter into the marketplace? Uh, talk to your Democrat legislators about patients who are making choices between paying their rent and getting their insulin. I mean, so just by crafting the message, uh, I've now hit both sides on the same issue. So there's ways to approach that with pretty much everything that we as physicians would be concerned about. So don't, don't give up just because you don't agree with their position on abortion or second amendment or immigration or something like that. Stay focused on healthcare. Fantastic. And with that, we are going to have to wrap it up, but well, I, um, I love it that we ended on a nonpartisan point. Yeah. yeah. I just want to add something here. Our next two panelists are, both with patients. So we have a few minutes if anybody wants to add on any other thing. Uh, yeah, because kind of missing them. Go for it, Bob. Okay. Well, Absolutely. I love it. You know, uh, Marion made a point about it, just because something doesn't directly affect me. I, I, I was involved for a long time 
you know, with, with colonoscopy uh, reimbursement. And, uh, you know, we eventually got to the point where now at age 50, everyone can get a, uh, insurances are required to, to um, cover colonoscopy as a necessary service. And it, you know, in the long run, it, it, you learn from one issue, you, you learn about looking at it from a total healthcare expense uh, uh, matter. So if, if we get colonoscopies at 50 years old, it turns out we actually, our healthcare budget is less because we catch polyps before they become cancers. We improve outcomes. Uh, we give people longer lives. It's a win, 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 win. And, but when you're, you, you will have people on the other side of the table and, and specifically the insurance companies, this is, you know, we, we don't want to make this medically necessary. Um, so there's always going to be someone on the other side of you. Uh, but if you come in prepared, if you do your homework and you've chosen a topic that you know well and that you truly believe in and you have facts on your side, you just go there. You go there. And, and you don't have to call other people names or, or make them look evil. You don't have to demonize them. Uh, these are little tricks that you learn over time. And even in an area where I'm not an expert, you know, I have had my colonoscopy when I was 50. And, you know, that's a good thing. Um, uh, in the end with that battle, we ended up getting uh, out of right out of right field. Katie Couric came into the picture and she had a lot of influence over a lot of the people in government, it turns out. And that won the day. You never know where those uh, wild events are going to come. That is going to turn it from, you know, trench warfare into a victory. Uh, but even though you don't feel like you know a subject inside out, you are, you are a physician and you have that, that aura about you. You are very, very, very well educated. And people want to hear from people who are well educated and, and, and you know more than, than you think you know on a broad range of health. So don't let that be an obstacle. Uh, the other thing that I would that I would say is, um, um, I can't I can't tell you how often people say I just never hear from docs, I never hear from docs, and so be that doc that they hear from. Uh, let them remember you. And, uh, uh, we need it. Uh, even, give us one week. And, and David Balot, he. I give him a lot of stuff to do more than he can probably get done, but he'll give you stuff to do. If you can give him one week, he can, he can make you very productive. And uh, so go ahead, uh, put yourself out there, be brave. Whether you're young, you think you don't know a lot, they love to hear from young doctors, or if you aren't a subject matter expertise, we'll give you the reading material. Absolutely. Um Brennan, do we still have uh, time to, yeah, to uh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, so, uh, and keep us, just make sure that you come on in when the uh, panelists come on. Okay. Um, someone specifically asked, uh, can Tom comment on establishing a relationship with your representative who you know is on the opposite side of a particular issue in medicine? Um, in particular, she brings up scope of practice when your rep co-authored bills for full practice authority. Yeah. Uh, is yep. it a lost cause? Or? <laughs> I, I know the I know the the uh, the doctor uh, who who put that out there. I appreciate that, Patricia. Um, so look, at some point, you kind of have to have a conversation with your legislator after you've visited with them a dozen times uh, on the same issue, and it's clear that they're opposed to you. Um, you know. Every single one of us, you know, every vote we take can potentially have consequences. And so sometimes uh, it is one of those things. There is a point at which, you know, uh, continue to engage, but you may start looking for somebody else to do it better. Um, and I, I know the specific issue that she's referencing. Uh, and that's tough, you know, sometimes we look for progress. Uh, sometimes people will ultimately change their positions um, sometimes it's a constituent issue. Uh, I know that, especially on scope of practice issues, that one of the problems we run into is that some of these rural legislators, you know, they may not have an anesthesiologist in their district, but they've got a CRNA that they're very friendly with. 
Uh, and so that creates a, a natural tension there. But um, those are those are tough uh, issues for sure. And at po some point, you know, there is a point at which you kind of can't make any more headway. And it might be time to look for someone to, to take over the reins there. Maybe do it yourself. You know, that might be a great opportunity for you to give me a call and we'll talk about uh, running as a physician legislator and get some better representation there. Hey, Marion and Tom, there's one thing that we didn't touch on, uh, the importance of mentoring. Um, I know Tom had a mentor, Dr. Zerwas. I had a mentor. Uh, I know Marion's had mentors. Uh, if you are feeling insecure or even if you, if you know you want to do well at this, talk to someone who's been in the field a bit and, and, and look for a mentor uh, because that can um, – that kind of feedback, that kind of encouragement is priceless. And I learned a lot uh, from my mentor. Uh, and, uh, and you can learn a lot too. And I, um, I will uh, also say that like, if there's anyone out there that feels like they need the personal pep talk, I'm sure there's some way you can find me. I'll be happy. <laughs> I'll be happy to cheer you on. And uh, I, I tell people all the time, I really am like a, a soccer mom who just got sick of the system and decided, okay, I think I can do something about this. And I, I don't, I think there's people that have done way more, but if I can do it, you can do it. Um, we did have another question that came through. Brennan, we're still okay to surge forward. I, yes. Okay. I'm going to assume so. Uh, the question was, how do you think state and national medical organizations perceive grassroots physician groups, especially the new groups emerging because of the leadership voids at the state and national level? I'm fresh from our Pennsylvania um, House of Delegates uh, from this past weekend, and um, I was particularly pleased that we got a, a resolution passed by which now our, our state medical society is going to have to tell its membership when... Uh, the lawsuit updates need to be made about the uh, mock lawsuit that PPA helped crowdsource fund. So it's a big effort on PPA's part to uh, enact meaningful change and maintenance of certification. Uh, and now we have the state medical society behind us. Do I think that everyone within the organization and the leadership loved it that grassroots was discussed? No, but various leaders in the organization actually it. brought it up. Yeah. Oh, we okay? And I'll continue then. And served as kind of like a wingman. They brought up the work that um, PPA and its other membership organizations of free to care have been able to do with the grassroots group. And people that had been, two people that had been former presidents of the State Medical Association mentioned our grassroots efforts by name and wanted the leadership of the medical society to be aligned and to start looking towards grassroots as a way to collaborate and to get things done. So I think that it's buried within a, an organization. I think there's some feeling of threat um, from the grassroots, but we, those of us who were there that are grassroots advocates as well, held our ground. We were respectful in the way that we addressed everyone. We gave people the kudos and the credit when they needed them uh, and deserved them and really put out our effort to be collaborative. So. All right, Mary. Well, we have the next panelist. So um, thank everybody for joining. That's wonderful. Thanks for having us go thank over. You. And Bob and Tom, thank you so much for your fantastic.